Linux OTC. Welcome to episode 25. I'm Bill. And I'm Majid. Ah, uh, just two of us. Just the two of us. You know. You and I. Exactly. Um, well, we know from experience <laughs> the two of us can pull off a show, so I am not worried in the least. Oh, yeah, I mean, I can, I can talk bullshit for England, you know, um, so... That's not really going to be a thing. But I haven't spoken to you for a bit, actually, um, due to yeah, it's various been a while. outside. Been... Yeah, because there was a couple of things where I was abroad and then you've had a couple of things going on, unfortunately. Yeah. And so it's been a bit of a while, actually. So um, I'm trying to think. When was it like when I spoke? To... OK, so I've Gosh, had a couple. It's been a while. Yeah, it is. has, actually. So I've, I've, got, I've got a whole bunch of new tech since then. Okay. In, in that I um I've got a Galaxy S twenty four Ultra, um, and I, I got rid of my old uh well it wasn't old it was only a couple of months old One Plus Eleven and Galaxy uh, S twenty two the work one because I was able to yeah I was, I was able to sell it basically it's a short answer to that and um, I have been surprised as to how much I'm enjoying this. You know, I was really one of these guys that was like, wow, you know, Samsung are overpriced and, you know, they're just copying Apple and this, that and the other. But um, the reason why I switched, apart from the fact that I'm an idiot who likes to waste his money and, um, you know, gets sucked in by the hype, is I went abroad to Morocco um, recently on a holiday and the photos that I took with my OnePlus 11 um, disappointed me. Um, especially because it was a very memorable trip for me. It was a, you know, I was doing some kind of backpacking stuff. We were going off to some kind of religious center out in the mountains, you know, um, great scenery, you know. It was a very memorable trip, even though it was only four days. And I was annoyed with the images and the video I got back thinking, and it's not like I had a cheap phone. I had a OnePlus 11, you know, mm. it's a 800 quid phone it was when I bought it so when I came back um I was able to get this on a a, a good deal I mean I got 400 pound off and that's before the trading um and double the storage so I was like okay this is a no-brainer for me um so I got that yeah. and then and then interestingly I found that I have by accident uh become fully invested in the Samsung ecosystem because on that same trip to Morocco, I lost my earbuds and, and I was, I like traveling as in going to different places, but I hate the logistics of travel, like flights, coaches, buses, whatever. They really stress me out. So I always have to have something to kind of take my mind off it. And that's why I always have my headphone, my earbuds with me. And so I was like, crap, I've lost them. What am I going to do? So I, we were at an airport and there was a duty-free, so tax-free uh, Samsung Galaxy Buds FE that were there for a reasonable price. And there was, there was no taxes because it's airport. And uh, so I bought that. And so now I've got an S24 Ultra, Galaxy Buds, a Galaxy Watch, you know, and a Galaxy Tab. <laughs> so I'm like, I've somehow, not on purpose but become completely fully invested in the Samsung ecosystem. So it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting actually. Um, it's actually, in some cases you almost feel, I don't know what it is with that. I think we've gotten used to the, anybody that's ever been an Apple user, you've gotten used to the idea that once you start buying Apple, you keep buying Apple. And I don't know if that's a result of the advertising that they do or, uh, the quality of the product. I mean, if it was junk, you probably wouldn't have bought it. If you knew that Samsung earbuds were junk, you probably wouldn't have bought them. But they're not, you know, so it it almost feels like the right thing to do. I don't know. I mean, and, I think I think one of the things about Android, as I learned when using this, is Android is pretty interoperable. You know, um, I don't, uh, having never been a long-term Apple ecosystem guy, you know, never had an iPhone, I've spoken at length and ad nauseum about my experiments with iOS and macOS on this and on Minkcast. I'm not going to go through it all over again, but I've not been someone who has used all of these things in one go. So this is as close as I've got. And it is slightly more seamless, but not massively more seamless. You know, it was 
pretty much okay anyway. I mean, I used to have old Sony earbuds and I've had other um, accessories from different manufacturers and they all seem to work fine, you know. Um, never had any real issues with pairing or anything like that. Um, so I said, yeah, it is a little bit more seamless. I'll tell you one thing though. Samsung are trying to do an Apple with lock-in because I was looking at the codex that, the, that these earbuds do and they do SBC, they do AAC, and they also do SSC, which is Samsung Scalable Codec, which only works on Samsung devices. It is almost high-res audio. It doesn't have high-res audio or certification. I've just been learning about it for the last couple of days. I'm not an audiophile, but I was just looking into it. Um, apparently, to be, have high-res uh, audio certification, there's certain uh, criteria you need to fulfill. And the only ones that fulfill it at the moment are basically LDAC and the Aptex Adaptive. They're the only ones that do. Um, and so this one, the Samsung one, SSC, isn't technically high res, but it's good enough that you, you know, especially to someone like me who's not an audiophile, but only works with Samsung devices. So if I pair them with another phone or another device or my Windows laptop or whatever, then I'm not getting that high res stuff. So I thought, ah, this is a way they're trying to get the lock in because you're only going to get the best performance out of the device if you're f invested, you know. Yeah. I don't I don't know how true that is with Apple things. I mean, I'm assuming it's the same kind of thing that, you know, if uh, unless you're using Apple stuff with Apple stuff, you don't get the full feature set. I I had no idea that Samsung was in the codec business at all i it makes sense that they would be because um they would probably want to come up with something that like sounds really good on headphones which i would argue we've already got that i don't know like the dolby atmos you know that that is just fantastic technology for sound uh, i'm not i'm not an audiophile either i mean i i have gotten into it a little bit just from mastering some videos, you know, that I put on my jellyfin and stuff like that. But, uh, so it, 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 it's red, it's relatively recent. Uh, I think I want to say it's the galaxy buds pro, but it uh, might be yeah. the buds two pro, which are the newer ones of them. And now they came out, what, 18 months ago, two years ago, something like that. Um, and so, um, yeah, that's when they, they kind of got, you know, into it in that sense. Um, I, whilst I am not an audiophile and my hearing isn't the best anyway, I mean, I've had hearing problems in the past. So I often think that a lot of this stuff is wasted on me. But then sometimes you do get a good pair of headphones or something or earbuds and you notice the difference and you go, shit, actually there is. Even a noob like me can tell. So I remember I... um. I got some of, the, some of the Sonys, you know, the famous XM4s. Um, and they sound really good. If I if I want to listen to music because I want to listen and get an all, a proper, you know, if I'm sitting down to listen to music rather than I want something on in the background or while I'm at the gym or on my commute to work or something, I use those ones because sound feels better the sound stage it's bright it's the bass isn't muddy but it's still you know i it sounds good you know it gets me enthused and i do t i can tell the difference it's not as i said massive it's not like oh my god but i can and if i can as someone as i said not with the best hearing not an audiophile then they must be doing something good mm -hmm. i think it's amazing what they can do with just you've got two channels basically you're working with and they can they can add spatial qualities to the sound because they know people are watching tv on their phones they know people are watching movies on their phones tablets what have you and they've mastered the art of uh, putting the right i have no idea how they're doing it but the elements are in place to make things that are in front of you sound like they're in front of you and things that are uh, con contextually behind you to sound like they're behind you even with a pair of headphones on that's to me that's 
it's amazing enough when you hook up five speakers to something and, and they're able to send discrete audio off in whatever direction it needs to go. But when they're able to do that with headphones, I mean, they even get it. I mean, they're even getting to do that with phone and tablet speakers. I was, I've been uh, watching yeah. a, I've been watching a, um, a drama on BBC iPlayer called uh, Kin. It's basically a, it's, it's based in Ireland. It's Irish. Um, as in Republic of Ireland, and it's it's about gangsters, and it's not particularly the most original thing, you know, family and, you know, this dynamic, and, you know, this one's double-crossing that one and all that sort of jazz. But the actors are fantastic. I mean, it's got, like, Charlie Cox from Daredevil. It's got um, uh, Aidan Gillen and Kieran Hines who are on um, in Game of Thrones. So, you know, anyway, I've been watching it, and on my Galaxy tablet... And I'm surprised how well they've managed to get the surround type of thing going. And I'm like, okay, I'm watching this on my bed. I know the screen is in front of me, but why is it I, the sound is coming from over there? Mm -hmm. You know, and I think to myself, that is impressive. That is Especially impressive. on a tiny little speaker, like yeah, the exactly. size of a pencil eraser, you know. I, I don't know. It... Uh, Especially when you're a little older and you remember how crappy this stuff used to be, you know, and how it didn't seem like there was a lot of effort going on to make it any better, you know. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, it feels quite all of a sudden, these things are just run of the mill, uh, like they've just nailed it down and it's easy now, you know. I don't know. I, I, I am I, impressed by it, though. Um, I do have some Linux news because um, okay. I am no longer an arch user. I mean, I know technically I was a Manjaro user, but that's come on, it's close enough. Let's be honest. Right. <laughs> um, I, uh, I finally got rid of my, um, uh, Manjaro install, which I had on my Asus Zen book because, um, too many little paper cuts, too much just jank. And then whenever you want help, it's, you know, most of the help is for the more mainstream distros, you know, the Ubuntu based, the maybe even the Fedora based, you know, uh, and less for this. Um, however, I do completely understand one of the big things about why people choose Arch and that is software. Man, you can find anything in the AUR. I mean, it's, I mean, I was looking up, for, I was looking for some kind of really quite niche crypto wallet stuff and you know there were build scripts in you know for everything in the AUR and yeah. I was like I can really see why people I mean I know there's all sorts of your mileage may vary you have to check this you have to check that you have to check the build and where all that sort of stuff but just for sheer okay I need this piece of software and being able to get it and install it quickly as well um I was very impressed, I must say. I mean, I know there's flat packs and I know there's, um, uh, you know, snaps and all that sort of stuff. But at the end of the day, it really was um, really good, actually. But then I just thought, yeah, I, I just got a bit fed up, really, of just the kind of, as I said, the kind of just paper cuts and jank that you get with it. You're really, you are really riding the lightning on... I mean, it's it's enough so on Manjaro. I've often thought about Manjaro because it's supposed to be... Manjaro is kind of sort of anecdotally build the mint of... Uh, the mint of uh, the Archbase distros just because it, it takes what is essentially the main distro and then it adds that little bit of polish, a little bit of ease of use on top of the distribution to make it more palatable for normal users. I've wondered though, because the, th and I've never really had this properly answered and I did not use Manjaro enough to know if it was an issue because one issue you run into with Arch is when you've got something installed from the AUR and it depend it's got dependencies that come from the main repos and then those dependencies up and change underneath the AUR package 
sometimes that AUR package needs to be rebuilt, whether there's an update for it or not, just because yeah. you need to relink all the libraries and stuff like that. And I've wondered, being that you're dealing with a distribution that is holding back packages, and I'm not sure exactly how long they're holding them back, um, but they're not releasing them at the same cadence that Arch is, but yet people that are putting packages in the AUR, they're writing it for, they're writing the package build out to depend on a, um, a package that's in the repos, you know, and they're putting in version number uh, at or above such and such, you know, and do, no, do a I, lot of people I, run into problems with that? I mean, I think... I th I didn't, but that's because I'm a very normal user in in a sense. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not using. Um, I'm not doing. Ma I wasn't doing major big things on that laptop. Do you know what I mean? It was just a general purpose device. You know, I was I wasn't even doing this kind of podcasting stuff on it at all. So I didn't run into any problems myself. There were a couple of times I do remember getting updates and. Um, things would keep coming up, you know, n won't boot now. You know, I just had paper cuts, jank, that kind yeah. of stuff, but nothing that was a deal breaker in of itself. However, I completely understand because the way that I conceptually think about the AUR, and I'm, I don't know if I'm 100% right, is that there are no packages actually in there. What is in there is a script which directs your machine to where to get the certain the packages and then put them together and that's why there's so many things in there because you don't actually have to package anything yourself you just have to point things in the correct direction now i know that might not be a hundred percent accurate but that's the way i kind of thought about it's it. pretty close uh, yeah and, and so the package builds themselves are just scripts and then sometimes there are some packages that need like another script on top of that to uh, do some things with other packages or to set up it needs to execute some commands to set up these directories or whatever mm -hmm. so that these things install correctly but it's all scripts of one yeah. ki of one kind or another there's no binaries or or anything and in, so for, uh, for and so for someone like me um i mean i'm probably a security risk to be honest because i don't I, you know even if i was to look at these uh, scripts i wouldn't exactly know what i'm looking at for all i know they could be pointing me to you know um you know, some of some scam stuff or malware, I have no idea. But um, as I said, I didn't actually have any issues. I can imagine it being a problem though if you're a more uh, advanced user and you do use your that machine for, th that was the reason I used that machine because that wasn't a mission critical machine. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't one that I relied right. on for either work or podcasting or any of the other stuff that I do on my devices. It was... I don't want to call it a test laptop because it's that kind of denigrates. It's not, you know, it's a 16 gig, I, uh, 11th gen i5 with a half a terabyte of storage. So it's no slouch, you know, so I don't want to just call it just a, des a test laptop. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's the one that I would put, I would do any distro hopping on because I knew that, you know, worst comes to worst, I can just revert this back to Windows and just, you know, it's not mission critical as in that way. So yes, I can imagine that being an issue. Um, Guess what I replaced it with? Mm. Let me think. Um, Bodhi. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Linux Mint 21.3 Edge ISO. Uh, oh, so, yeah. Uh, so, did say I mean, something about the Edge ISO. Yeah, I mean, because kind of like, I mean, I'm on Mintcast, right? And I've been using Linux for what, well over a decade now. And. I really should use Mint a bit more, I think, <laughs> you know. And so um, I, I, th I think I mentioned this once on, on a Mintcast episode that, you know, I decided to put it, uh, Mint on one of my um, devices because I hadn't used Mint in, like, I calculated it out. It was almost 10 years. And then anyway, you know, life moved on, whatever. I'm using Ferran at the moment on that box, which is this podcasting one, which is, as we were talking about off air, is basically Mint with KDE um which is absolutely fine um but the in the last uh release uh which was the 21.3 edge iso that was the last the release notes that came out they talked a lot about the touchscreen gestures and things that they'd uh, put in 
and touchpad and stuff like that. And I find that touchpad and touchscreen gestures are one of these things that you do not need, but once you get used to them, that you notice when they're not there. Oh yeah, like multi monitor. Yeah, once you yeah yeah it's <laughs> once it's you perfect. have it, you can't you cannot yeah. live without it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean <laughs> it. It's like also like with um. Oh, I mean, you know, there's many, many examples like that. Things that you never thought you'd, you need, but now you do. Or like, for mm-hmm. example, um, you know, if you have, a, if you're using different Android keyboards, as in, you know, virtual keyboards, and once you get used to the swiping, when you use when you use one which doesn't have that functionality, it's weird. You know, it's like your hand goes to do that, and then you realize. Anyway, so that was one of the reasons why I. Um, thought, well, yes, if I'm going to use something, well, why not? Because uh, use 21.3 Edge 4, it has touchscreen gestures, even though it's on X11. Uh, It has better touchpad support. And at the same time, because it's the Edge ISO, it's running the new, a much newer kernel, uh, 6 dot something compared to 5.15 on the mainline Mint version. And... um, The best compliment I can say about Mint is it's boring. And I, and I mean, and I don't mean that in a derogatory sense. I really mean that in, it gets out of the way and you do your stuff. So if, if it's about getting work done, that's the distro to go for. If you want all the bells and whistles and cool new hotness and, tinkering then it's probably not the one for you just because it doesn't scratch that itch as well um and as i said you know once you get used to certain things the fact that they're not there is a bit odd so like just even just small things like i was um trying to figure out how to change the brightness on cinnamon and i'm there looking for some kind of quick toggle and then i realized there's no quick toggle. I just have to use the hardware buttons like like a Neanderthal, you know. <laughs> um, just because I was used to that on every other distro or Android or Windows that I, I'd been using for God knows how long. Um, but it but it, it is it is very performant. I mean I I mean Linux is always performant anyway. Mint is always pretty you know quick and de bloated anyway. But it's still really good um, yeah. and. You know, it it just um it gets out of my way, and I can you know what more than elementary, I would say Mint is the Mac OS of the Linux world because it oh does. My. I mean, I know that's a big statement. Send your comments to Majid. <laughs> at... <laughs> yeah, I, and, and uh, again, and I mean that purely in a descriptive way, in that it makes some choices for you, it gets out of your way. And it enables you to do the work that you want to. The advantage it has over macOS is that it's a very familiar desktop paradigm that you don't necessarily have to learn new things for. And you can still do things as and when you want. I I, couldn't, I got really annoyed with macOS when I used it. Um, but at the same time, I can see why, it's, uh, you know, it did just work. You know, the one thing I've not tested, by the way, is Bluetooth. Which I did because I know that Linux and Bluetooth don't go well very well together. So oh I need God, to check how that works. So I need to check even how on that Arch. Works. Okay, <laughs> Arch um, is the only distro I've tried to get Bluetooth to work on, and it like it'll work for a week, and then all of a sudden it'll stop working, and it's because some file gets written that tells the adapter to not start up at start time and then when and that so then you change that file and then the next time the bluetooth stack updates which is frequently on arch uh it doesn't work again so i wrote myself a script to uh just basically to delete that file at every startup you know i've got little hacks like that set up just to make up for the stupid crap that happens when you're writing the lightning on a distro like uh, like Arch. Uh, interestingly, I have went back to Mint 21. I, th- I guess it's 03, 21.3 on here. Uh, and effectively ending my little excursion with LMDE using 
SID on the back end. And for those that don't know what SID is, that is that is the code name for Debian's unstable repo. And it's basically it's basically writing the lightning almost as much as Arch does, if not more in some cases. And uh, I mean, I, w I had been thinking of when I was, you know, uh, changing uh, distro as to whether to go for LMDE, actually, because I thought, actually, I've not tried LMDE uh, for a very long time. You know, if, if I've hardly used Mint, I've used LMDE even less. Um, well, the only advantage I can tell right now is that we're in a place where you're going to get more up-to-date apt packages from LMDE just because it's based on a later version of Debian than the Ubuntu version is. Mm -hmm. So you're going to get a, so for the stuff that you're installing from apt, you're going to get a little bit more updated packages until later on this year when, uh, uh, Mint 22 comes out, then it'll be rebased on uh, uh, Ubuntu, what is it? Ubuntu 2404. Yeah. For the next LTS to come out. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. I mean, I'm still running, so, but I'm still running Ubuntu 2310 on my uh, work machine. But that's because I I wanted something that, yeah, that was a, that is a bit more of a mission critical machine because I do do actual work on it. Um, that's and so, that's the problem I ran into is I couldn't get uh, a decent version of Wine to work. I mean, you just for a mission critical machine, you want boring, don't you? You want the you want the thing that's just going to start up and work without any yeah. crazy surprises, you know. And um, yeah, I'm I've just kind of made peace with the idea that if I want up to date software, you know, the the flat packs are out there. They're I guess they're good enough. They're just as good. In the fact, in in the case of a few, um, in the in the case of a few projects, the flat packs are the way to go, and that's like coming from the developers at this point. And that's that's another thing I'm dealing with with Arch. Is I think I've only got one thing installed from the AUR at this point, and that's just the the uh, Mozilla VPN client. I mean that is no... true. I mean that is true actually on Mint as well. That when you actually go to start searching stuff in the software center. Yeah. Nearly everything that comes up is flat pack. You know, um and and not only is nearly everything that come up flat pack. Flat pack is what is promoted as it were. You know, so even if there is a dev package, the default if you didn't do anything and just searched for I don't know, audacity as an example and then you saw it and you you know, you click install, you'd get the flat pack. You know, you'd, if you wanted the repo version, you'd have to do a little bit of digging in that sense. Yeah. Um. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think things like flat packs and snaps. I mean, I've got no real problem with snaps, to be honest. But I mean, um, I know that some people feel very strongly about that. In fact, did you see the news um today that uh there was malware on the snap store? Yes, I heard about that. Yeah, uh, that, that, that I did have a wry smile to that because it's kind of like so the it was a bit. It was a Bitcoin thing. Somebody lost a substantial amount of money. Yeah, and... because because it's uh, it was, you know, because the the one of the problems that people have with Snaps is the Snap Store, the fact that it's closed source, it's run by Canonical, you know, it's centralized in a way that FlatHub isn't, and so you would have thought there'd be better gatekeeping. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, if anybody wants to do evil do malware then they'll find a way of doing it but um it did seem slightly ironic that it was the snap store rather than say flat hub which and you know had the malware right and well now my problem with the snaps is basically and i don't i don't know how big of a problem this is but it seems to me just based on what i've heard from like uh popey and that over at uh Linux matters when snap was in its, I won't say infancy, but in its kind of heyday when it was like the top of the list of the things we talked about, they were aggressively going out and selling this to companies that were providing software and that, and they talked all these people into uh, creating the snaps. And then they had a, 
a crew full of people that were making these snaps for, you know, various reasons. And now the company is somewhat restructured and some of the people that were making the snaps don't work there anymore. And you've got certain packages that are in a couple of cases, I think over a year or two, uh, since their last update. So it feels like it was one of those things where they went after the developers. Hey, you got to use this thing. You got to use this thing. You know, the snapping snaps and flat packs are the future of, of uh, packaging on Linux, you know, and then it kind of seems like they got everybody signed up, but then I don't know how much follow-up has been done, how much, you know, sticking with the program has been done because it really feels like some of the packages have stagnated. OBS Studio, for example, uh, last I looked was almost two years old, uh, the package version of it. So uh, that was yeah. part of the point behind, you know, using these things was that we were going to get up-to-date software and and it will work because it's packaged with or it comes alongside all of the necessary libraries and things that it needs you know and in the case of snap because it's and i don't know if it was just it was just because it was canonical backing it and then the minute the minute that kind of i'm not going to say goes away but they're being less uh vigilant about it um I mean, actually, I think it's an interesting case study in uh, showing the advantages of open source software. What I mean by that is that for people who don't use uh, open source or people who decry open systems, one of the things they say is, oh, there's no quality control. There's no overarching narrative. It's too much fragmentation. Every can do whatever they want. You can't trust this, that, and the other. And advocates, on the other hand, for open source will say, well, you know, a thousand eyes looking at the code is better than one eye looking at the code. Um, and so things will work better and things will be more performant and whatever. And it's played out with Snap and Flathub, hasn't it? Because what you've got in Snaps is, I mean, I'm okay, I'm not talking about Snaps, I'm talking about the Snap Store, sorry. When yeah. you look at the Snap Store, it's closed source. It's run by a company. So there's only a certain number of people looking at the stuff, right? You've got Flathub, completely open source, right? So everybody can see all the code. Everybody can see. And so it's brought the quality of that up. So it, do you see what I mean? You know, so you know, uh, the, the one thing that um, you would have thought you wouldn't have is exactly what you do have when you have um, closed source and companies and whatever. You have bad code. You know, I mean, Windows, for God's sake. <laughs> you you could argue that that fragment, fragmentation, that these containerized formats were supposedly here to rescue us from, it's created even more of it. Because what we still have, we still have a situation where if you want the best version of a piece of software, and I'll use OBS Studio again, uh, if you want the best version of a piece of software, you've got to do a little bit of research and see and go to their website and read what they say, and they'll come out and tell you, well, our, we directly uh, support the flat pack. You know, there is a snap, there is a repo package, but mm -hmm. the flat pack is the one that ships with the browser extension and, uh, you know, a couple other th little bits and bobs that make things work a little bit better. And um, that's where we're still at, in spite of the fact that we have new technologies that were supposed to come along. And, you know, they've solved the, a couple of problems and created or augmented a couple of others that... Here we I mean, still are, you know. I mean, I, I see where you're coming from. I mean, I don't want to come out as some kind of um, flat, hub, uh, flat pack advocate and snap hater or whatever. I, I don't know enough, frankly, to be even yeah. to probably have a sensible opinion on it. What I would say, though, is that like a lot of these things they have their uses and they have and they work in certain certain things work in certain environments better so it seems to me that snaps work better on server type hardware yeah what uh, flat pack seems to work better on desktop flat pack on the other hand is less 
customizable, I found with some of the apps because of the kind of containerization. Um, so I'm, the example I'm thinking of uh, is Vivaldi because Vivaldi has a flat pack out now and it's not, uh, you, you get these weird kind of theming issues that occur with it because I think, because of the fact that it's containerized compared to the dev package. Um, the open source community, unfortunately, will always have fragmentation. Um, in the in the grand scheme of things, it's not the most, if you think about it. You know, um, we have whittled ourselves down to probably, what, four package formats and three universal package formats, I would say. Basically, yeah. Yeah, which, I mean, and because of the fact that a lot of them aren't interoperable, like, for example, there's not many distros that both do .debs and .rpms. There are some, I know, Blend OS and Vanilla and yeah. all this kind of stuff. But generally, so really, that that makes it come down to only three, if you think about it. Because App Image will work with everything, because that's mm -hmm. the way it's designed. As long as you got access to Fuse 2, I don't know what oh, the that, oh, is yeah. with that. Oh, yeah, that, yeah. That, that's a good point, actually. didn't think of that. Mm -hmm. But, okay, but generally speaking, App Image will work with nearly everything. Your... Your distro repos, so as in the .deb, .rpm, .dnf, Pacman, whatever, those will work, right? Yeah. And for f and if you want Flap or Snap, you do actually have to install Flap, you know, Flap Pack, or Snap D, right? So in yeah. reality, it's only three, really. So it's not massive fragmentation. Do you know what I mean? Okay, so here's the question. You're you're a big software company and you, okay, you're Adobe and you've decided all right, we're going to go ahead and start supporting Windows. But here's what's up. We're only going to do this on one format and be done with it. What what do we choose? Do we choose Snap? Do we choose Flatpak or do we choose to just put out an app image that is basically uh a fetcher installer kind of thing like steam does um so i'm not adobe obviously and i don't know how they would think but my guess would be they'll go with snap oh okay and the reason for that is not a technical reason but a corporate decision okay because if you are a company and you are going out on a limb, not even going out on a limb, if you're going for a project and you're trying to do something, you want you want to be able to achieve that. And if you're not able to achieve that, you want to know who you can blame. And you yes. can say that we, we were trying to do this. We went to you because you were a trusted provider and you said it would work and it works, great. It doesn't work, okay. It's your fault. Sort it out, right? You can do that with snaps because because of Canonical's oversight. Because canonical, yeah. Now that's interesting well, because at first I thought the the obvious answer to that is flat pack because you've got access to more users that way. But what you're saying is, for a big company, they want another big company to to uh, be to hold responsibility because I'm, yeah because. I'm, as I said, I mean, I, I'm not a businessman, but, you know, I've been involved in the NHS, which if, you want, if one way you want to put it, is a big company. Um, and you you start noticing patterns of thinking. You start noticing things, what, what is important to people, right? And I don't know the code bases and stuff behind it, but I don't think the technical reason is the first thing that comes to people's minds. It's the corporate managerial side, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because actually, if Adobe really wanted to get most number of users um, and have something that works as best as it can, it would probably make a dev package. If you think about it, if 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 what it wants is as many people that can use it with no limitations on what part of the system it can interact with and in what way. And the fact that Debian based uh, distros are more common generally than other types, then 
you would they're going to want to make one version though that's going to work on tw- like 2204 2004 everything that's being supported right now no matter what libraries and what you know yeah, whether so it's, it's Wayland it's, on the back end or whatever you know yeah so it's, so if you take, if you make one for an LTS if 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 they made it for say 2404 that means it's supported till 2904 5 years and but, then but some, would that would that deb work also for the people that are using uh twenty three dot ten or something like that? Or does that matter? Do we only is it I fair mean, to only support I, one version? Okay, as I'm now coming up to the limits of my technical knowledge, so I don't know. <laughs> but because how, that was that was one problem that the snaps fixed was we can put out one version of the snap and that snap will work on every version of Ubuntu. Uh, that's so being that, supported at the moment. So would that not be the same for a flat pack as well? Yes. Okay. But flat pack doesn't have, like you said, that that uh, responsible party really behind it. I mean, there's a lot of responsible parties, but you don't have that corporate backing, like you said, which I hadn't even considered until you mentioned it. Yeah. But I think I think you're probably absolutely right. Um, and so that's the kind of thing I would have, uh, I would think. The thing about a, a massive number, you know, I want as many people using this. Well, if you want as many people using it, you make your things for Windows and Mac, don't you? <laughs> you know, let's be, unfortunately, we are 1%, 2% of the market. And, you know, even if we double, that's still going up, you know, we're still in single figures. Um, and that's what has stopped so many um, big companies coming out with proprietary software for Linux because of the fact that it's not worth the hassle to to do this. and plus the fact that it is you know it is inverted commas fragmented um so but yeah no I, I I think in these things often the corporate sensibilities will take over any kind of technical uh things and you know yeah you yeah, know if I think you're the, absolutely right if they if there are you know clear lines of responsibility and tiers and managers and all that sort of stuff then that's the way they're going to think because remember a lot of people who make decisions like this aren't technical um i, I mean they almost certainly are not <laughs> i mean you know you look at uh, i have a couple of friends who are project managers and a lot of the projects they do have nothing in at all to do with their background you know, they've they've been project managers for, comp- I don't know, a pharmaceutical company over here. And now they're a project manager for BBC. And it's like, obviously, the principles of project management are the same. You know, the kind of, you know, finding your team, finding out who to do this, how to delegate managerial aspects and leadership, in, you know, when to innovate, all that sort of stuff. And I get all that. And that's why you can do a generic project management course. But what that means is that they don't necessarily know the ins and outs as well. I've seen this in the health service. I've seen this where managers will come and they'll say something which sounds absolutely ludicrous because we're in the health sector going, you obviously don't know how this works, do you? Like, well, well in, why is it that the doctor needs to review the patient before the operating list? They've all been seen by a nurse anyway. So why can't we just send them to theater? And it's like, you obviously have no idea how anesthesia and surgery work. That is terrifying. And then you sit and, and then you yeah. sit and you explain it to them and then they go, oh, okay, fine, fair enough. But do you yeah. see what I mean? They're yeah. coming at it from a purely logistical, corporate, if you want to use it that word, managerial aspect and not looking at the technical stuff because they don't know the technical stuff. Right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, might, I, might be, I might be completely talking out my ass. I mean, I often am. So. No, I think what you said made a lot of sense. And I didn't even consider the fact that if, if I'm a big software company that's been doing business with the likes of Microsoft or something like that for years and years and years. And it has been made clear by some miracle uh, that it would be in our best interest, we being or our being whatever company we're talking about. Um, Adobe is a good example of that, I suppose. Um, It's been in our interest. It's been made clear that it's in our interest to at least provide some sort of linux support so what what would be the most meaningful way to go about that and i my thought was well flat pack obviously because 
you have certain distros like uh, Mint and that that just don't even ship with with Snap. And in fact, you've got to jump through a tiny little hoop to get Snap installed and enabled on your system. And Flatpak just comes. If a lot of these distros, if they pick anything, they pick Flatpak just for whatever reason. But there's no technical boundary other than removing a file to keep people from using snap that being said you're it's arguable that your vast majority of users are on uh ubuntu itself or one of one of the uh uh derivatives and and you're right uh that Ubuntu is backed by Canonical, Snap is backed by Canonical, and Canonical can actually give you marketing people to talk to when it comes to, hey, uh, we're thinking about releasing this on uh, on Linux, and we'd like to talk to somebody about Snap, you know. Um, and familiarity is also very important, and what I mean by that is that the big companies might be, a um, big company might be used to dealing with a big company. And so yeah. it it will have its internal processes and policies and how to do with that. Um, when the pandemic hit and we all went to remote working, well, not we all, but, you know, a lot more remote working video conferences rather than meetings and stuff like that. Why do you think that Teams became the big winner rather than Google Meet or Zoom? In the, I, I, I'm maybe it, maybe it's different per sector, but I know that within a week, two weeks of lockdown, Microsoft Teams became the standard way to meet with anybody in the NHS and, frankly, in the UK, UK government. Why was that? Because there was already established partnerships already there. Yeah. You already had um, people might have known people. You know, people who are involved in IT procurement might have actually known somebody in Microsoft, whatever, because they'd been dealing with them for their office and their Outlook and their exchange servers and stuff like that, you know. And so it was it was much easier. I actually had a situation slightly at work where we're trying to bring in a piece of software to streamline the um, pre-op assessment for children. Well, actually, for adults originally. There's a piece of software is being launched. I said, well, we need one for children as well, because as you know, I deal with um, children's anesthesia, pediatric anesthesia. And I found this, uh, I was recommended this good piece of software. I went to uh, some of the IT bods and I went, look, this is what's being used in neighboring hospitals in our region. What do you reckon? And the IT guy was like, you do realize that the adult one that we've got has a children's section on it as well. We haven't bought that bit, but we can. And I was like, oh, okay. And then he explained to me the vagaries and the difficulties of purchasing IT products in the National Health Service and how it is much easier when you've already bought something from somebody to extend that, yeah, than yeah. getting a completely different solution because then you have to go through all this clinical governance, you have to go through all this information governance, you have to go through procurement policies, this, that, and the other. Even then, by the way, it's still been 18 months and it's still nowhere near to being launched, right? But yeah. that's with so much of the stuff I'm, we're not having to worry about. So, you know, it's, so therefore, yeah, exactly. So, you know, big companies are just going to, they're going to go with familiarity, aren't they? They're going to go with, uh, or like, for example, another um, IT related thing at work was, uh, I mentioned on the, um, on, on Mincast as well, was uh, I was work, whilst I work 90% of the time in the NHS, I do do the odd, uh, uh, do work at, the one of the local private hospitals once in a while and uh i ended up working on the day that they were doing their big shift from paper records to electronic records and you know the software had all been launched we'd all had the training which was a bit annoying because the training was in the evening so i had to give up one of my evenings for it um and it was by far, it was by no means the worst piece of software I've seen, but it wasn't that good. It really wasn't. But, you know, they'd bought, you know, tons of new computers, touchscreen ones, fitted them in every office in, and in every OR and, and every, e, you know, ER clinic room and everything like that. And, you know, it was, it, it, it made me just think that 
why why all these soft pieces of software still so shit <laughs> you know it, by far it wasn't it wasn't the worst by far but i really sat there thinking this isn't the best this has not been designed very well it's on a touch screen but it's using windows why on earth would it would you want a touch screen thing and windows why would you do that you know um i even remember once with the trying to change it from because i know that windows 10 and 11 has a tablet mode so i actually tried to change it to tablet mode only for him to tell me that the piece of software only works in desktop mode so it's a touch screen thing right but it only works in desktop mode <laughs> and i just kind of just sat there going okay fine i will say that they're the one piece of decent software that i found um in medical it is this um one that we used in maternity which is basically based around ipads there's all these ipads everywhere and you know it's touch first and it is actually really helpful and useful except the one time when you can't get hold of an ipad and you have to use a computer to get it to work and then it's like using something under an emulation layer on a computer you know which is itself a thin client you can just imagine how bad this is going to go do you know what i mean um <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, and, and, and I'm sure it's because people are thinking, well, you know, it's, um, oh, you know, the better the devil, you know, we all we already know Microsoft, we already know X, Y, we already know Canonical, we already know Ubuntu exists. Plus, we've got an established relationship with this uh, vendor over here, that being Microsoft. We we tell them, hey, we're thinking about implementing this thing or that thing, and, and you know, they're quick to bring their products before you which you're already bought into their ecosystem so they're anyway we got to wrap it up um let us know what you think folks show at uh, linuxotc.org uh comment directly on the website join us on our discord sometimes that discord gets a little bit of uh, attention sometimes it don't it comes and goes we haven't put on an episode though for a while so that might be something but uh, we'll be back in two weeks. Until then, I've been Bill. And I'm not doing it. <laughs> I'm He's Majid. been Majid. <laughs> yeah. See you, folks. See you later, folks.